it can get you two of everything. Thank you very much. At 48 comes a line that resonates with the rebel in all of us. Get the man, boy, get the man. Paul Newman plays a man refusing to submit to the inhumanity and brutality of prison life in Cool Hand Luke. When Strother Martin, who plays the captain in Cool Hand Luke, says, What we've got here is failure to communicate. It is one of the most threatening lines. And you know, it's the beginning of what will be a never-ending cycle of torture towards Cool Hand Luke. If you just listen to me, stop trying to run away, let me communicate, everything will be all right. Nah. I wish you'd stop being so good to me, Captain. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Never! Never! What we have here is a failure to communicate. What we've got here is failure to communicate. One of the best lines in cinema in terms of time and place, because because of Paul Newman's character as Luke, and there was that whole thing of a younger generation not relating to an older authority figure generation, which was portrayed by Stratham Martin in the prison movie. And the what we have here is a failure to communicate almost summed up the mid-60s in America. What we got here is a failure to communicate. Well, I think he got the message. Next up is a movie character with more famous one-liners than crushed velvet suits. <laughs> Swinging into the countdown at number 47 is comedian Mike Myers and the shaggy-haired, shagadelic Austin Powers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, baby! <laughs> yeah, baby! Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Everyone knows it. Everyone says it. I say it. Why? One, because Mike Myers is a brilliant writer. Very shagadelic. And two, there's only two words to remember, so it's easy to mimic. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Austin Powers, the debonair and defrosted super spy, has put question. words in everyone's mouths. Ooh. Do I make you horny? Do I make you horny? <laughs> I like to sit in the mornings when I'm in my daggy pyjamas and no hair and makeup done and, and morning breath. I like to go to my husband and go, Do I make you horny? <laughs> do I make you horny, baby? Yeah, do I? He certainly did not make me horny at all, baby. Shall we shag now or shall we shag later? I would love to meet him and go, Where did you get this material from? How did you get that perspective? on the ultimate egocentric, sleazy guy. I shagged a rotten baby, yeah. And making it so funny and lovable. Yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> At 46, gangster movies are known for gritty one-liners. Wanna play this? And this may be the grittiest. The one film that all my friends can quote back to front, front to back, sideways, upside down, is Scarface. In this bloody but brilliant 1980 cult classic, Al Pacino stars as a Cuban crime lord with an influential friend. Okay. Do you want to play what? Okay. No. Say hello to my little friend! Say hello to my little friend. Say hello to my little friend. Say hello to my little friend! That is the most uh, quoted character in, in any movie by men. That line has permeated popular culture. In fact, Russell Crowe used it a year or so ago when he was hosting the, uh, the AFI Awards. That was very funny. Because if there are any problems and you do get up here and go on too long, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> Al Pacino and Scarface really took on a life of its own after that movie. I don't think when that movie came out it was a big hit. Now, every gangster on the street is going around saying, Say hello to my little friend!
Stepping in to 45 are the Blues Brothers, two singing and dancing siblings who destroy most of America in a bid to bail an orphanage out of bankruptcy. Is there a better excuse than this one? We're on a mission from God. Well, the Blues Brothers, when they said we're on a mission from God, they were getting in so much trouble and, you know, the police were chasing them and they were breaking all the laws and everything, but they were on a mission from God, so it was OK. <laughs> yeah, we've wrecked the whole city of Chicago, but we're on a mission from God. we got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes, it's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. You align yourself with God and you can do anything. We're on a mission from God. Don't you blaspheme in here! Don't you blaspheme! Yeah. Look at the terrible things they do. You know, I think it's just an excuse to get away with stuff. We're on a mission from God. Still to come on 50 to 1. It's like a high school girl's wet dream. What? Everyone can copy him and love it. I just like the sound. Pure evil. Oh, this is the best line. <laughs> Welcome back to 50 to 1 Great Movie One-Liners. And just when you thought it was safe to get back into the countdown... <laughs> there's something fishy at number 44, and it starts with a chilling cello. <laughs> The movie Jaws stars a small coastal town terrorised by a man-eating great white shark. I remember the uh, the guy, he was burling up the water. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chump some of this shit. And as he's just kind of, oh, blase, where's the shark? Is there even a shark out here? Burling up, suddenly... The whole audience went... <laughs> and in the face of terror, actor Roy Scheider gives us this snappy one-liner. You're gonna need a bigger boat. <laughs> There's the line. It's very, very much the Bushman attitude, isn't it? Yeah, gonna need a bigger boat. Mm. You're gonna need a bigger boat. I can't immediately think of a line that that underplays the situation so perfectly as this one. The scene is like nightmare. You're gonna need a bigger boat, right? I always say that every time I go fishing. You need a bigger boat, and it's not because the fish are so big, it's just because who doesn't want a bigger boat? And from shark hunting to ghost busting, we're nuking spooks at number 43. It's right here, Ray. It's looking at me. If you want spider. ghosts... <laughs> slime. He slimed me. And ray guns. Who you gonna call? Ghostbusters! There's something strange in the neighborhood. Who you gonna call? Ghostbusters. We all know who you're gonna call from the theme music. I love Ghostbusters. But it's never actually said in the film. It's from the title song, but they don't actually say it in the movie. They go close to saying it in the ad that they do. Pick up your phone and call the professionals. Go Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. But no, they don't say it in the movie. It snuck into everyday speak. Someone said, who are you going to call? And you just go, Ghostbusters. I don't blame Ghostbusters for the uh, who are you going to call line. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. I, I blame them for one of the worst rap songs of all time. At number 42, Jim Carrey is the world's biggest TV star, but doesn't know it in The Truman Show. And that's what makes this memorable line so ironic. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. 
Well, The Truman Show came along before we really had learnt about shows like Big Brother. So it was a whole new concept to us. He was a guy whose whole life, without him knowing, was being lived out and played out in a TV studio surrounded by actors. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening and good night. His life is all on television and his life is not real. His parents aren't real. The weather's not real. I found that really sad. Morning. Morning. Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you. Good, good afternoon, afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> oh. and, and it goes to the, the people, the Japanese folks sitting around the table for watching it. Good afternoon. Good, good morning. Good evening. Good, good night. <laughs> it's, just, it's a beautiful thing. Truman. <gasps> You can speak. Eventually, Truman realizes his world is totally unreal and decides to escape reality for reality. Who are you? I am the creator of a television show. Then who am I? You're the star. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. All right. One, two, Three. Oh, sorry. Leaping Good. high no, into no, no, no. 41st place is the chick flick Dirty Dancing. <laughs> Dirty Dancing is like a high school girl's wet dream. I mean, you have an ugly duckling girl, suddenly the stud of the world comes in, twirls you around a couple times, and then takes your virginity. I mean, that's a great movie, if you ask me. Of course, there has to be a problem. Dad. But I don't want you to have anything to do with those people again. But can I just explain? Nothing. It? You'd have nothing to do with any of them ever again. He doesn't want his baby dirty dancing. Um. And like every heartthrob hero, Patrick Swayze rescues his heroine with a great one-liner. This is the best part of the movie. This is when Johnny finally kind of stands up to baby's dad and he sweeps in like a knight in shining armour and he takes her from the clutches of her overprotective daddy and reveals her as the woman that she's become. Nobody puts baby in a corner. No one puts baby in the corner. What's going on there? Yeah, whatever. Go figure. It's just a real kind of, kind of it's a really romantic kind of thing, you know, and standing up for his girl. So, you know, what's not great about it? I guess. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Good one-liner, but it wasn't really about that. It was about the music and the song. And I've had the time of my life. I swear. Is it that one? Yeah, I haven't seen it. At number 40, it's Batman. Well, the Joker, actually. You see, there's an old Hollywood saying that the bad guys get the best lines. Tell me something, my friend. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? That line really is just pure evil. Sort of so pure Jack Nicholson. The use of that line, it's right at the core of the whole comic book culture in America. Obviously, Batman lost his parents. And that line was said at the moment that he lost his parents. Tell me, kid, you ever dance with the devil by the pale moonlight? Nearly all those heroes of comic books in America, they all had some childhood trauma. That's where their superpowers come from. Tell me something, my friend. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? What? I always ask that of all my prey. I just like the sound. <laughs> it's now being said again, it works as plot because it reveals who the killer was and it works as psychologically because it takes him back to the childhood trauma that gave him his superpowers in the first place. So it, it solves everything. The Joker may have had the best one-liner, but Batman had the last laugh. Have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? <laughs> Looking ahead on 50 to 1, this is a stupid line. Come on, it'd still be relevant today. You don't understand. This is a very sad line. <laughs> it's inspiring. Welcome back to 50 to 1 Great Movie One-Liners. 
Up next, Russell Crowe is an angry barbarian who loves a fight. Oh, and he's also in the movie uh, Gladiator. What we do in life? At 39... Echoes in eternity. Gladiator's General Maximus prepares his warriors and us for the brutality that is to come. That opening scene that goes on and on in Gladiator. At my signal, unleash hell. At my signal, unleash hell. At my signal, unleash hell. And you look at him and it's like he could actually unleash hell. Maximus is Rome's greatest general, leading a last decisive battle against the barbarians. He's the epitome of the Anzac, isn't he? Love him. Get out there, unleash hell. How incredibly appropriate. That one line just really summed up his whole character in that movie. If you're going to do it, you do it for real. Unleash Hell is exactly what Russell Crowe did again and again. He spoke the line clearly. At my signal, Unleash Hell. Didn't he get an Academy Award for that? Congratulations. At number 38, Marlon Brando is a dockyard worker subjected to a lot of peer pressure in On the Waterfront. Dirty, stinking mug! And I'm glad what I've done to you! This is a very sad line because uh, Terry Malloy, this broken down longshoreman, as we'd say, wharfy, and he had the chance to be a great boxer, but his brother insists that he takes a fall in a fight, and that's the end of his boxing career, and it's back to the wharves. It's this heartfelt regret that leads to Brando's poignant and memorable line. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. The thing that I find most poignant about that line is that the potential that so many people have that is never realised. And he knows that about himself. And that's what's so sad. I think that line, you know, pretty much summarises um, feelings we've all had, whether it be about our careers, about our lives. You can take this. There are moments we all share where we felt we could have been contenders. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. It really struck a chord with, with the working class of the world, you know, the battler, the unions, the waterfront, the man who stands up for things in so many ways, and it still does today. It'd still be relevant today. No matter what you achieve in life, you always think you could have done something better, and something's held you back. And for him, it's that one moment. You know, it's like Eminem, you know, in, in Eight Miles. The one moment, you get one shot, and he was denied his one shot. One shot. You're nothing. OK, I've just compared Brando with Eminem. I really should go home. <laughs> While we're on the waterfront, Here's a line from a movie where the unsinkable happens. Titanic. At number 37, Leonardo DiCaprio is a poor working class boy sailing to America, where a new life of opportunity awaits. I think is fantastic in that he was a stowaway on the boat and there were people on that boat who were multi-millionaires. He jumped on at the last minute and he had the freedom. It, it was all so spontaneous, so he probably did feel like the king of the world. Anytime you go on a boat now or a ferry, you're just really thinking, oh, can I get up there to the bow and just give it a try? I went sailing and I did the Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm the king of the world! I've done that on the front of my dad's tinny. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> Manly fairy, I stand up the front with the wind in my hair. I'm king of the world! So the people from the psych hospital come and get me. <laughs> this is a stupid line, you know, and uh, I think Titanic's a fantastic film, but this is a bad one-liner from it, and, and this is a line that contributes to people bagging out the film, because James Cameron had to hold the Academy Awards up and go, I'm the king of the world! 
then everyone went, well, now we don't like you anymore. At number 36, Dead Poet Society stars Robin Williams... Well, come on. ..as a charismatic 1950s English teacher who doesn't do things by the book. They're not that different from you, are they? They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. There's the most powerful scene where he gets the boys and they're staring at this black and white photo of these guys that have died. 100 years ago from the same school, and he says, you know, get closer, listen to the boys, what are they saying? Carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. Robin Williams is everybody's favourite school teacher because he teaches everyone to grab hold of the moment, seize that moment, and get out there and just do everything that your heart desires. It's a great sort of um, one liner for all of us. I mean, I try and practice that. Carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. I watched the whole film going, I never had a teacher as cool as that guy. Now, in this class, you can either call me Mr. Keating, or if you're slightly more daring. Oh, Captain, my Captain. And the carpe diem was what he was saying. Get off your ass and seize it, do it. I love that that became part of regular everyday language again. Suck the juice out of the marrow of life till it runs down your chin. Seize the day, carpe diem, it's inspiring. For the first time in my whole life, I know what I want to do. And for the first time, I'm gonna do it, whether my father wants me to or not, carpe diem! Perfect film. Beautifully cast, Robin Williams was fantastic, and when he delivered that line, it was just like, yep, what a great message that is. Thank you. There's more ahead on 50 to 1. <laughs> Every line that he said was just one of those memorable sort of lines. <laughs> Welcome back to 50 to 1. At number 35, it's proof that a great movie line isn't always what you say, but how you say it. In The Mask, Jim Carrey is a shy bank clerk who finds a magical mask that puts a spring in his step and a one-liner in his mouth. Smoking! They knew that if he went smoking, that people would be saying smoking. Smoking! Smoking! Hopefully, if the film did well, six months later, so it's kind of calculated. Smoking! The Mask was the perfect character for Carey, allowing this rubber-faced comedian to do what he does best. You know, the thing with Jim Carrey as the mask, every line that he said was just one of those memorable sort of lines. Now you have to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well... Do you? My youngest was about five when that came out, and he then said that. Smoking, Mum, smoking. He said that for about a year and a half till I was quite happy never to see Jim Carrey ever again. Okay. Ah, <sighs> oh, Jim Carrey, so much talent. He turns me green with envy. Someone else who turns me green is director Quentin Tarantino. Not through envy. His films can turn your stomach. Three hard-boiled stories intertwine in 1994's Pulp Fiction. I love you, honey bunny. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! It's a film with many classic scenes... Oh, yeah, I'll with you. ...and one very creepy one-liner. Well, wing out the gimp. What's a gimp? <laughs> Well, that's what, I think that's what we're all asking. What is a gimp? I've always thought a gimp was somebody who maybe had a limp. I hope no one ever says that to me. Pretty 
bring out the camp. I've seen enough that's made me cringe already. What's going to happen now? This is disturbing. Just when you thought this movie couldn't get any weirder, they bring out the gimp. Bring out the gimp and the drumming on the gimp's head. That is the best bit, that. That line was so wrong and it still now comes out whenever someone wants to say something, you know, like, <laughs> you know, whenever someone's being a little bit dirty, a little bit naughty, it's, you know, they'll bring out the gimp. At 33, a classic line from a classic story. In the 1948 adaptation of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, orphaned Oliver's hunger is greater than his fear. But at least he said, please. Please, sir, can I have more? With that, you know, tiny little voice, and you'd think, oh, yes, your poor little love here. Have, have a whole leg of lamb. Just give him some more. So when he says, please, sir, I want some more, he's so hungry. Please, sir, I want some more. Oh, he was brave because he was confronting these dreadful people that ran the poor house for more food. The truth of it is that these little boys were dying in poor houses, you know, while the, the d board of directors were eating, you know, turkeys and ham. Oh, Lord, we thank thee. We do expect it because we know Oliver Twist so well, but perhaps those who don't are just startled by this little boy who doesn't know about the wickedness of people, and he just goes up there and says, please, sir, I want some more. It has a, a, a dynamic force. Please, sir, I want some more. From a very articulate nine-year-old who's starving to a monosyllabic boxer with a hunger to win. <laughs> Punching his way into 32nd spot is Sly Stallone as Rocky. A two-bit fighter who gets a million to one shot at the world title. It's funny because in the Rocky movies, apart from the da na na da na na I just always remember the, uh, yo, Adrian. Yo, Adrian, it's me, Rocky. Look at it. You believe all this? Yo, Adrian. Yo, Adrian, it's me, Rocky. Yo, Adrian. Like Rocky again, you know? Yo, Adrian. Stallone at his indecipherable best. I think he said Adrian. Yes, behind every great man there is a woman, as, uh, Illustrated by Rocky Balboa after having the, the Jesus smashed out of him by Apollo Creed, and you know, the first thing he wants is, Adrian! Adrian! If he didn't take every punch in the head that was given to him in Rocky in real life, I don't know who did. Hey, Oscar. Rocky, you went the distance, you went the 15 rounds. How do you feel? All right, all right. What are you thinking about when that buzzer's out without life? Adrian! What you think about when Adrian! Adrian! Out? Adrian! Oh, Rocky! I couldn't understand the guy. Can you understand the guy? No, oh, come on! You heard him, ladies. You, Adrian, I did it. It was the best finish to a movie there ever was. Where's your hat? At 31, it's a quotable quote that's never spoken. <laughs> but we know it when we hear it, thanks to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. <laughs> <laughs> Janet Lee is an unsuspecting guest at a motel run by a cross-dressing psychopath with a big knife. All you can really do for Psycho is really just go... 
I don't think I've ever seen that movie, but I've seen the scene. And we've probably all done it. Without that kind of sound, you wouldn't have Psycho. This music is so memorable, it still gets sampled today. After the break on 50 to 1. Really creepy. She sailed very close to the wind. You know, I met your kind before. What the heck is that supposed to mean? That's right. Come back to 50 to 1 great movie one liners. And at number 30 is a tasty little one liner you can really get your teeth into. In the silence of the lambs, Jodie Foster is a novice FBI agent assigned to interrogate notorious serial killer Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter. Anthony Hopkins, he was really creepy as Hannibal Lecter. Good morning. And you can't ever go and order a Chianti anymore without thinking of that line and those scenes. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. It isn't the actual line that makes it work. It's the at the end that makes it so memorable. <laughs> you can see him remembering the flavor. <laughs> you fly back to school now, little starting. Fly, fly. In those few words, it encapsulated where he's at, that he would eat part the human body, he'd, just the way he said it, and that he'd enjoy it. You know, you actually really did believe that he enjoyed eating pieces of people, which is horrid. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. I must say that it was because of hearing the word on the screen that I actually looked for Chianti in our liquor store. <laughs> I thought, I must try Chianti. I've forgotten what it tastes like. That line I've always found absolutely disgusting because I would find a Chianti way too heavy for liver. I'd be thinking more like, I say, a chilled rosé or maybe a Sangiovese. I've never had Chianti or human flesh, although I have eaten at the Channel Line canteen. At 29, it's the real story of disc jockey Adrian Cronauer, whose wake-up call to the madness of war is also the title of the film. Good morning, Vietnam! Wow! I feel good! Adrian Cronauer was this great disc jockey for, for Armed Forces Radio, and Good Morning uh -uh, was his signature thing, and it started in Cyprus and it was, good morning, Heraklion. <laughs> and then he moved to Vietnam and it was, good morning, Vietnam! And who better to play a wise-cracking wild man than wise-cracking wild man Robin Williams? He was just shooting the shit. He was just, you know, it was just coming to him. And that's, he was basically doing stand-up as the cameras rolled. What is it demilitarized on? Sounds like something out of The Wizard of Oz. Oh, no, don't go in there. What a lot of people forget in that line, there were no good mornings in Vietnam in the middle of the war. Good morning, Vietnam! Hello, campers. Remember, Monday is malaria day. Good morning, Vietnam. What the heck is that supposed to mean? Well, the rumour is that Robin Williams, of course, had lived whole chunks of that film. Sure, you'll get a punch in the face from the scriptwriter for saying that, but he did. That's a bad, that's, that's, that's a word. Good morning, <laughs> Behaving badly at 28, it's Mae West, the 1930s queen of quotes, 
How did you know there was a man? Well, there always is. You know, it takes two to get one in trouble. Mae West, she was the first person to go on screen and say, you know, I'm going to be strong, sexy, demanding and completely immoral. Writing all her own dialogue, Mae was famous for reeling off racy one-liners. You know, I met your kind before. Why don't you come up sometime, huh? Come up and see me sometime. Mae West was a walking catchphrase. She uh, brilliant work and um, a genius. Age did not weary the mischievous May. In her very last film, Sextet, the 85-year-old Ms West gave us this classic line. Mm, is that a gun in your pocket or are you just glad to see me? Is that a gun in your pocket or are you just glad to see me? What a great line. Mm, is that a gun in your pocket or are you just glad to see me? She was so cheeky and so wrong. Think about what she's implying. It's practically porn. Well, yeah, maybe in a way it is. She managed to get away with outrageous stuff because it was funny. My conscience is clear. Is that a gun in your pocket? Or are you just pleased to see me? What a frightening looking woman she is. I'm the girl that works at Paramount all day and Fox all night. You don't have to have too brilliant an imagination to figure that out. At 27, we learn an important lesson from the film Poltergeist. Never build your home on an ancient burial ground, or you may have unexpected guests. It's the way she says it that turns this into a memorable movie line. On paper, it's, they're here. But she says, they're here, and gives that really scary sort of ring to what's going on. TV people. Uh-huh. I always had one mate every time someone rang the doorbell. They're here. Stop being funny in 1987. Stop doing it. I think spooky children are spooky because they're serious. They're here. And so to have a little girl in that beautifully sweet little girl voice saying that in a moment that's supposed to frighten the hell out of you is, uh, is completely eerie and makes complete sense that it got burnt onto people's brains. Well, that movie just confirms it. TV really is evil. They're back! <laughs> Barreling in to number 26, Tom Cruise is a Maverick fighter pilot called Maverick in the high-octane Top Gun. It's pure adrenaline. Like, when you hear that line, you know that it's about pure adrenaline. I feel the need, the need for speed. Ow. Yeah, smack him. I feel the need, the need for speed. Every man in the universe loves this movie. I know lots of girls do too, but I feel the need, the need for speed. Yeah, good on you. Hollywood, you look good. I'm going after Viper. I'm sure that appeal to every boy in the world who, you know, wants to put his foot down and fly along in his car. But he hit the brakes, so he'll fly right by. Woo! Oh, Tom Cruise. I mean, every guy wants to be him in that movie and every girl wants to date him in that movie. I don't like you because you're dangerous. That's right. Nice. Man, I am dangerous. It's only when you look back on it now you realise how dicky that movie actually is, but at the time it was like the coolest thing ever. I feel the need, the need for speed. Looking ahead on 50 to 1. How do these lines happen? We say that all the time. Jousted stick. It's all about the, the saliva. Punch him in the face. One fight at a time, fellas. Welcome back to 50 to 1 Great Movie One-Liners. Now at number 25, it's a girl who wants more from life, which shouldn't be hard when you grow up in a town called Porpoise Spit. Huh. 
In Muriel's Wedding, actress Toni Collette is the family dreamer, rebel and disappointment. And it's a three-word summary of Muriel's life that became a regular part of our language. By sleeping on a pillow, that's probably your shape. You relieve stress on muscles. You're terrible, Muriel. You're terrible, Muriel. You're terrible, Muriel. She's just so daggy and she's just so not cool. When she says, You're terrible, Muriel. Like you know what terrible is and you're telling me I'm terrible? She's sort of secretly from afar admiring Muriel's tenacity and chutzpah for getting out of that situation. Sits around the house like a dead weight. Watching TV, sleeping all day, getting arrested at weddings. You're useless. You're all useless. You can't help saying it, you know, when one of your friends is terrible. You're terrible, Muriel. Any time, any occasion, you're out dancing, telling a joke, spill something at the dinner table. You're terrible, Muriel. We say that all the time in our life, because people are always doing things they shouldn't do. This is a line which really says, Muriel, stop being terrible. Give up, die, just, just, just be like the rest of us. And of course she won't. At 24, we cry for the humanity that screams inside all of us. What a great film. And, yeah, it, it, it is memorable, and it's a good lesson for all of us that people do suffer, can have pain, can be afflicted, can be malformed. In The Elephant Man, the true story of John Merrick, a sideshow curiosity fights for dignity in the face of repulsion. The way he says it, from the depths of his soul... I am a human being! I am not an animal. He no, is a coming. freak. How else will he live? Freaks are one thing, there's no objection to freaks, but this is entirely different. This is monstrous. Wonderful film, John Hurt playing a man who has a terrible bone deformity and grows up in a most terrible way. How do I look? Splendid. It's all about the, the saliva. So that, that's the key to it, right? I'm not an animal. I am a human being. Very good, my friend. It is interesting that people remember this line from The Elephant Man because I don't actually think a lot of people saw this film. I am not an animal! I really, really like the line because I think every human being has to get to a point in their lives where they stand up for themselves. Never has uh, an actor physically, you know, taken on as daunting and challenging a task as John Hurt did in that film. And it was like a lesson in, you know, humanity. It doesn't matter what you look like. We all have feelings. At 23, an angry office worker finds release in bare-knuckle fistfights organised by his strange new friend in the confronting cult hit Fight Club. Without pain, without sacrifice, we would have nothing. This is your pain. This is your burning hand. It's right here. Now, every club has rules. And who can forget Fight Club's first rule? Welcome to Fight Club. The first rule of Fight Club is... I think that line connected with a lot of people because it, it became something like when you were talking about something that was taboo. You do not talk about Fight Club. You'd take it and make it your own, like the first rule of this hen's night. The first rule of Fight Club is... Don't talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. It's a little bit like whatever happens on the footy tour stays on the footy tour. The adrenaline and the secrecy struck a chord in the film and in life. This now happens not in dark, gloomy cellars and out of the way. In fact, you turn on your TV, you're likely to see it happen at the tennis. I think I need to see Fight Club again, because I, I saw it once and I, I don't think I understood it. I think I need to go see it again. Because you can't ask anybody about it, of course, because... You do not talk about Fight Club. You do not talk about Fight Club. OK, we won't talk any more about Fight Club. Moving on.
At 22, the Terminator, a cyborg assassin with an Austrian accent, is sent from the future to kill an innocent woman. I'm a friend of Sarah Connor. Arnie had only 16 lines in the film. Can't see her. She's making a statement. But there's no denying. Look, it may take a while. I want to wait. There's a best He made there. this one count. I'll be back. It's the delivery and the accent, because it's only I'll be back. And Arnie did come back with impact. He drove a car through a building or something. Well, suddenly you remember that line. I'll be back. It's a great line, because you do say it. You do kind of throw it in. I'll be back. I wonder whether he'll use that line if he ever actually loses the governorship of California. I'll be back. At 21, a teenage underdog is rescued from bullies by a strange man with knowledge of the martial arts in 1984's Karate Kid. In 1984, I was 11 years of age, therefore the Karate Kid was a huge part of my life and a huge part of how to be cool. Wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. All I thought when I saw that was an old man telling you to wax his dick. It's like bugger off. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Fast wash all the car. Then wax. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Wax. Oh, what do I have to wax on? Remember, dear. He was just getting him to do the chores, because if he was training him, he would have said, punch him in the face. <laughs> when Ralph Macchio kind of stands up and says, you know, what are you doing here? Kind of all I'm doing is, is, is all your chores. I'm learning nothing. Not everything is as seen. Oh, bullshit. I'm going home, man. Danielson. 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 Show me wax on, wax off. When he threw a few punches at him. Jack! 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 And he started going like this, you know, chopping on it. So you thought to yourself, let me argue. Come back tomorrow. The only thing kind of about that movie that was more repeated than the lines wax on, wax off, was the actual non-verbal kind of repetition of this everywhere you went. Finish him! Everybody you knew was standing on one leg doing the crane about to kick you in the face. How's the serenity? How's the serenity? So much serenity. What do you call these things again? Resales. What do you call this? Chicken. This is going straight to the pool room. This is going straight to the pool room. You should use it, Dad. Ah, the castle, with more Aussie one-liners than you've had hot dinners. But one saying had a dream run into our hearts. And what'd you pay for it? 180. What was he asking? 250. He was dreaming. Excellent film. And so Australian. Proudly Australian. Dad, some guy's selling an overhead projector. Nah. Now hang on, Steve. What's he asking? 150. Tell him he's dreaming. How good is that? It is so Aussie. It's bloody fantastic. The castle, a great Aussie story. And to see the family sitting around the table reading the classifieds, and Michael Caton delivers that great one-liner. Ergonomic chairs, four of them. What's he want? 180. He's dreaming. When I was at school, I remember those words coming together, but it was. He's dreaming. Dad, what's a pulpit? Not only are you stupid. Where the minister gives his sermon from, how much? You got no sense, no understanding of anything in life. 800? Your head's not screwed on properly, but you're dreaming. Dreaming. Up next on 50 to 1. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Yeah, honey. He's got a knife. So relevant to so many situations. You want to call somebody? It just nails it. I want to tell you my secret now. <laughs> Welcome back to 50 to 1 Great Movie One Liners. Now at number 19, it's the longest long distance phone call in movie history. <laughs> Straight 
Stranded on Earth, E.T., the extraterrestrial, is given love and protection by a young boy. In return, E.T. gave us three magical moments. The glowing finger. A bicycle through the night sky. And a memorable one-liner. E.T. phone home. E.T. phone home. Most people that said it would stick their little finger out like that. E.T. phone home. I remember watching this when I was little. E.T. home. You know, the message was that everybody just wants to be home and E.T. go home. You want to call somebody? Yeah, there's a point you see that he is stuck in a place that he doesn't understand and they don't understand him. E.T. phone home. That plead to go somewhere, we call it outer space, and, and he called it home. It kind of symbolises, you know, find a way to get your message across. I think probably one of the only times that a famous line has been uttered by someone that's not a human. E.T. phone home. I hate to think what that call could cost. At 18, it's Crocodile Dundee and the Aussie Bushman's adventures in the concrete jungle of New York. When Mick Dundee leaves Australia and lands in America, he's actually really out of sorts. He doesn't understand how the toilet works. One dunny, one bidet. Bidet. Mm. It's for, um, after you, you, um, you know, you figure it out. You would almost start to worry that, hey, this city could gobble him up. A knife gets pulled on him, but that doesn't phase this particular guy because Crocodile Dundee has his own special weapon. And his own special one-liner to match. There you go. And your wallet. Nick, give him your wallet. What for? He's got a knife. <laughs> That's not a knife. That's a knife. It cuts across, you know, all walks of life. So relevant to so many situations that, you know, that, that is one of the... That's probably the most recognisable line, I reckon. <laughs> that's not a knife. That's a knife. Come on, have men stopped using this line yet? Because any time they wanted to impress about anything, they'd pull out the old knife line. That's not a knife. That's a knife. Big knife, David and Goliath, Australia, one nil, everybody happy. You all right? I'm always all right when I'm with you, Dundee. <laughs> now that's a one-liner. And to find our next movie, quote, we're following the yellow brick road. Trouble. Some place where there isn't any trouble. Do you suppose there is such a place, Toto? Dropped into 17, it's Judy Garland as Dorothy, the farm girl whisked away from her boring rural life to a magical land where she'll find the Wizard of Oz. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And the iconic line from Wizard of Oz, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Well, duh. No, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Yeah, I think we're not in Kansas anymore. It's just wonderful, eloquent comment. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? For me? Funnily enough, I've used that line. I've a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, once or twice. I'm not a witch at all. I'm Dorothy Gale from Kansas. Oh. The first half of the film, when they're, when she's in Kansas, is black and white. And then she arrives in Oz and the film <laughs> explodes into Technicolor. So when she says... I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, honey, it's pretty obvious. We must be over the rainbow. God bless her, Dorothy does want to go home and I've never understood why. She wants to go back to that boring, dusty, black and white world that she used to live in. There's no place like home. 
At number 16, it's The Sixth Sense, the story of a tragically troubled child played by Haley Joel Osmond. I want to tell you my secret now. His only hope is Bruce Willis, a psychologist struggling to gain the boy's trust. Haley's secret would make any parent shudder. I see dead people. When he goes, you know, I see dead people. You're like, oh, yuck. God, he sees dead people. Ah! In your dreams? It's a great line because it's what the film's about. The film's about a little boy that sees dead people. So to make the memorable line in the film, the line that describes the central plot of the film is pretty clever filmmaking. Dead people like in graves and coffins. Walking around like regular people. Children are so innocent that to hear something sinister come out of them is really frightening. How often do you see them? I see dead people, and of course he does, because Bruce is dead. And, oh, have I ruined it? I didn't mean to. It was a twist we didn't see coming, and a one-liner we'll never forget. I see dead people. There's more to come on 50 to 1. I'm going to pick a fight. One of the most famous sequences in movie history. I oh, know guys like that. I'm home. There are that many of them and that many of us. You're going to get your ass kicked. Welcome back to 50 to 1. And now for some simple words of wisdom from a simple man with a sweet tooth. <laughs> Sitting at number 15, it's Forrest Gump, a social innocent taking an incredible journey across the cultural landscape of 1960s America. OK, here's a quick point. If I was at a bus stop and Forrest Gump sat down, I'd leave. Do you want a chocolate? I'd leave. I don't care how many chocolates he's got. I'm out of there. Happy to dole out the sweets. I could eat about a million and a half of these. He's also generous with his view on life. My mum always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Coming out of Forrest Gump's mouth, that means, you know, it could be a soft sender, it could be a hard sender, it could be anything. But um, whatever you get, be happy with. Life is like a box of chocolates, and I always get Turkish delight, and I hate it. Life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And it's pretty true, isn't it? You never know what you're going to get. I, I can't take it seriously, nor his box of chocolates. Mind you, occasionally when I've looked at a box of chocolates, I've thought of him. This film had an assortment of great one-liners, including one from the girl who was sweet on Forest. Run, Forest, run! Even now, when I run, there are certain friends who will go, Run, Bianca, run! Run, Forest, run! When I see joggers, I yell that out to them. Run, Forest! Run, Forest, run! Well, he has to work off all those chocolates somehow. At number 14, Robert De Niro's Taxi Driver is an ex-Marine with a psychotic manner and a habit of talking to himself. You talking to me? 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 Ain't nobody else in the room. Uh, the script said Travis looks at himself in the mirror. And De Niro went on and lived one of the most famous sequences in movie history. Well, then who the hell else are you talking to? You talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here. One line repeated over and over again, which shows just how crazy this taxi driver is. Robert De Niro, of all the actors there ever was, somehow can give out menace. Oh, yeah? Huh? 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 you. Jeez, I wouldn't want to cross that guy. He tried to make himself believe that he was scary. You talking to me? No, sorry, sorry, Mr. De Niro, it wasn't me at all. It was him. Well, I'm the only one here. I don't even know Taxi Driver, and I know that you talking to me. Listening to all that talkback radio in the cab would drive any taxi driver over the edge. You're dead. <laughs> Shh. 
Shooting across the cinema heavens into number 13 is Star Wars. This space adventure showed us that we are all connected by something we cannot see. Hey, Luke. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. Just perfectly researched by the man who wrote the film, God. Use the force, Luke. The force is strong in this one. May the force be with you is the most powerful line ever said in a movie and I think it can be used with so many different applications. It's even like a weird little blessing when you go off on your adventure somewhere. It's like, may the force be with you. <laughs> if someone were to use the line, may the force be with you, my initial reaction would be to look at them sideways first. But <laughs> the force, what is it? The force? The Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. I think everyone believes that there is something out there in the universe. And that's why I think that particular line really, really works out in the public. I'd like a bit of the Force. I always like a bit of the Force with me. May the Force be with us. May the Force be with you. Here are Scotland's turns. Lower your flags and march straight back to England, stopping at every home you pass by to beg forgiveness for a hundred years of theft, rape and murder. At number 12, it's a line from a ranting and raving Mel Gibson. Do it not, and every one of you will die today. But this time, he's having a go at the palms. <laughs> Braveheart tells the true story of Scottish rebel William Wallace, who leads a violent uprising against British rule in the 13th century. Bastard. I want this Wallace's heart on a plate. Mel with the blue face, the long hair, out in front, you know, the Scots undermanned. Many years from now, would you be willing to train all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take Oh, freedom! When you're trying to impress people and get them to follow you and rally the troops full support in the office or whatever you're doing, it's actually a great line. They seem quite optimistic to me. Maybe they do want to fight. And so obviously he'd been home practicing that line in front of the mirror. He could take our lives! But they'll never take our freedom! But they can't take our freedom! Well, maybe this way. Where are you going? I'm going to pick a fight. Perfect script for him to give it the great. They may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. You know, and they're all like, Whoa. I don't care how stirring the speech is from your leader. There are that many of them and that many of us. You're going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> That's just reality. Isolated at number 11 is Jack. What are you doing down here? In the 1980 adaptation of Stephen King's The Shining, Jack Nicholson plays a tormented writer who takes a job as winter caretaker at the Erie Overlook Hotel. Little pigs, little pigs, let me come in. Cut off from the world with his family, supernatural forces within the hotel turn Family Jack into Frightening Jack. It's perfectly clear from the moment you see Jack Nicholson on screen that this is one scary, sick dude. I don't think that's true. And he emerges in full flight with a shatteringly good one-liner. Here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. Here's Johnny. I mean, here's a line, here's Johnny, that's about Johnny Carson. And yet we all know it's about Johnny Carson. Here's Johnny! Here's Johnny! Here's Johnny! And that 
Nicholson in Saying It in the Shining and turned it, here's Johnny, into like hours of torture and bitter and horrific, you know, mayhem. Johnny Carson was never on TV in Australia. We know more about America than we do about Australia. So if they did it in Oz, it would be like, here's Bert. After the break on 50 to 1. I wish I didn't love you so much. The writers who write these lines are very clever. I know what you're thinking. Whoa. Everybody says it. You just tell me, what can I do for you? It's the Picasso written across the bottom of the painting. My name is Pussy Galore. <laughs> Welcome back to 50 to 1, great movie one-liners. And at number 10, it's the most famous name in movie history, but he still feels the need to introduce himself every single time. We know his number, 007, but what's his name? We found out first in the movie, Dr. No. Mr. Bond. James Bond. And the line has been in every Bond film since. The name is Bond, James Bond. Is he? Are you? Yes, Bond, James Bond. You could do that naked and a girl would probably still say, fine, Mr. Bond, can I get you something? I think James Bond, 007, dickhead. Bond, James Bond, is very... George Lazenby. My name's Bond. James Bond. I'm Bond, James Bond. It's a signature, that's what it is. It's, it's the Picasso written across the bottom of the painting, that's what it is. And he could take any gorgeous woman and just sweep them off their feet. I mean, there was nothing that man could not do. My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. I think he's a fool. This line has also been in every Bond film. Uh, just a drink. A martini, shaken, not stirred. 007 has a license to kill. Well, won't you join? His liver. Not on duty. I think the vodka martini, shaken, not stirred, is a fantastic line. And I, in fact, have a friend that we traditionally go and have martinis just to help keep the film alive. A martini, shaken, not stirred. Why would you shake it anyhow? I think it said a lot about James Bond that he knew exactly what he wanted. How do you take it? He is a naughty boy. He's a naughty boy, Mr. Bond. Straight up. At number nine, it's Dirty Harry, a cop who solves the dirtiest cases with a mean stare, a big gun, and a powerful line. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Well, to tell you the truth in all this excitement, I've kind of lost track myself. But Ian, this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and would blow your head clean off. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? you got to ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Do you feel lucky, punk? Line is that it comes after this great speech about, you know, you got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? It could blow your head clean off. You know, like, whoa. Are you feeling lucky? Punk, you know, that little pause. But you don't have to see the film because everybody says it. You know, it's been said in so many different ways. You gotta ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? The come and get me kind of attitude that Clint Eastwood kind of squint. You gotta ask yourself, do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Hey. I got to know. It's a forgettable line in a way, but he does it with such authority. Oh. Dirty Harry. What an incredible character. And the only one in our countdown to get quotes from two separate movies. <laughs> At number eight. It's the Dirty Harry sequel, Sudden Impact, and Clint Eastwood has a new taunt for the crooks. Go ahead, make my day. Go ahead, make my day. I mean, that, everybody uses that. President Reagan even used this quote in a speech. And I have only one thing to say to the tax increasers. Go ahead, make my day. The threat looking at these guys that were, were killers, and he was going to give them 
worse than they could give him. So he was sort of taunting them. We're not just gonna let you walk out of here. Who is we, sucker? Smith and Wesson and me? Go ahead, make my day. <laughs> the writers who write these lines are very clever and they're just touching the spot. Go ahead, make my day. Jerry McGuire, how you doing? Jerry McGuire! <laughs> yeah, how you doing? How am I doing? I'll tell you how I'm doing. I'm sweating, dude. Cruising in to seventh place, it's Jerry Maguire. Did you not tell my wife more personal attention? I said more personal attention. Good. Tom Cruise plays a sports agent struggling with his ethics, and even more so with a demanding client. I'm a sun devil, man! What, what can I do for you, Rod? You just tell me what can I do for you. Show me the money. <laughs> it's not just words, it's that person, everything about him, coming out and believing and wanting these things. Show me the money. <laughs> and show me the money gets used every day around this place. <laughs> show me the money. Show me the money. That's it, brother, but you got to yell that shit. Show me the money. I need to feel you, Jerry. Show me the money. Jerry, you better yell. Show me the money. <laughs> I use that at least three times a week. A friend of mine's talking big, talking big. I'm like, show me the money. Show me the money. Show me the money. Please, get over yourself. Money! Oh, Jerry, does that make you feel good just to say that? Show me the money! Show me the money! Show me the money! Yeah! Show me the money! Show me the money! Show me the money. Everybody who has ever been in show business picked up that phone to that agent <laughs> and said, show me the money. Congratulations, you're still my agent. Of all the scripts of all the films in all the world, one has more memorable one-liners than any other, and we couldn't select just one quote from it. It is, of course, Casablanca. <laughs> Set in Morocco during World War II, it's a love triangle between exiled American Humphrey Bogart his ex-girlfriend Ingrid Bergman and the other guy that no one can ever remember. But everyone remembers the piano player, Hello. Sam. I never expect to see you again. And that's when Ilsa utters the most misquoted line in movie history. Play it once, Sam, for all time's sake. That's right, not play it again, Sam. Casablanca is a great movie. Nobody knew what they were making when they were making it. They certainly didn't know what the story was about because they were writing new pages of dialogue every day. And there's Humphrey Bogart running this nightclub, gambling joint, bar, whatever. And into this melee walks the beautiful Ingrid Bergman as his lost love, Elsa. Sam, I thought I told you never to play. Rick cannot believe, and he says, all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. Oh, that's a great line. It's, 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 it's a wonderful line. Mind you, the weird thing is, as someone who's been drinking regularly for years, I've... What is a gin joint? You can almost rewind that scene in your mind. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she had to walk into mine. You could actually break it, break the whole movie down into great one-liners. Round up the usual suspects. Be my captain. What about us? We'll always have Paris. But the best one is, here's looking at you, kid. Here's looking at you, kid. I wish I didn't love you so much. The funny thing is, the movie's writers were being sacked as it was being filmed. They were writing these great lines that have gone into the history books, yet they got fired as a result. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. After the break, we reveal our top five movie one-liners. Welcome back to 50 to 1 as we reach our top five movie one-liners. Taking fifth spot are five words spoken by an extra. These are the only words she says in the film, but they're the ones we remember. Oh, 
Coming in at number five, it's When Harry Met Sally. Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan are uh, uh, friends without benefits, but sex keeps rearing its pretty head. Yes! Great scene. Don't make me do it. Yes! In an unforgettable scene, Meg proves what a great actress she is. Yes! yes. Oh. oh! But it's the following line that went down in history. I'll have what she's having. Well, everyone wants what Meg Ryan was having. It's cute. I'll have what she's having. And Lord knows that woman, it's been a long time since she's had what she's having. Every girl knows how to do that scene. Let me tell you. Oh! I'll have what she's having. <gasps> oh! <laughs> you know, and who said, you know, stop banging the table. Oh! oh. I'll have what she's having. I mean, that woman is so famous for that line. You know, if you could, if you could just order that at a restaurant, there would be no food. And who is she? The woman who actually said the line in the movie is the director's real-life mother. <laughs> How funny is that? I wonder if they knew that I'll have what she's having but it's going to go into the language. Well, these days, if you do see someone um, having a great time, it is such a good line to use. I'll have what she's having. Oh! oh. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, now to tonight's number four. Actually, you can't handle number four. Defence calls Colonel Nathan Jessup. At number four, it's Jack Nicholson. Again. In A Few Good Men, he plays Colonel Nathan Jessup, a high-ranking Marine Corps officer defending his decisions at Guantanamo Bay. Colonel Jessup, would you raise your right hand, please, sir? Very powerful line, and one of the lines that will remember Jack Nicholson for. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Beautifully controlled, and it also nearly made you believe that he was bigger and more powerful and stronger than that whole courtroom around him. You can't handle the truth! You can't handle the truth. It's got to be the most parodied line in movies. And, you know, Nicholson just had such fire and brimstone when he shouted that out. You can't handle the truth! I don't think anybody else saying this line would have given it half the impact that Jack Nicholson gave it. The truth! You can't handle the truth. Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You! You, Lieutenant Weinberg! Who's going to do it? You! You, Lieutenant Weinberg! I live with a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago's death, and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. The thing about Jack Nicholson uh, that makes his lines so memorable and, and why he probably appears in this list a few times, I think, is because he's such a kind of a memorable character as a person. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Threatening their way into third place, it's Brando and Pacino in The Godfather with a line full of mafia menace. I'm gonna make them an offer he can't refuse. I'm gonna make him an ass he can't refuse. And then they will fear you. Yeah, I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. Oh, wouldn't you like to be in that position? It's become a classic line in not just about people leaving horses' heads in somebody's bed, but in all sorts of business chat. I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Al Pacino is the Godfather's good son, Michael. He knows how his father gets things done, but has sworn not to enter the family business. My father made him an offer he couldn't refuse. What was that? My father assured him that either his brains or his signature would be on a contract. People use it every day, every day, in every walk of life. Uh, and it's, it's uh, funny, it's funny. So you're going to make someone an offer they can't refuse. It's all couched in the idea of, um, of uh, manners, you know, and of honour and dignity and all of those things. So it's, it's a classic piece, of, you know, it's bullshit, they're thugs. And he says it with such a steely coldness. Tom? Hey, Mike, are you sure about that? Mo loves the business. He never said nothing to me about selling. I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. And it's as if 
everything he's ever said about not being part of the family business, <laughs> at that moment, he is everything that the family business is. Germany. Colonel. With extreme prejudice. At number two, Apocalypse Now tells the story of a soldier with a deadly secret mission in the Vietnam War. I took the mission. What the hell else was I going to do? En route, he meets Robert Duval, an officer with an unexpected fondness for the weapons of war. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. This is probably my favourite line. In, in films ever. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. You know one time we had a hail bomb? For 12 hours, when it was all over, I walked up. We didn't find one of them, not one stinking big body. It's saying that uh, Americans love violence. If you're in the army, if you're a career soldier, you got to love it. it. Smells like... victory. The voice that Duval had in that film and his, it, the scale of his character and the way he was dressed and the way he, his character had sort of gone off the end, so to speak, I think helps that become a great one-liner. What's your name, Senator? I think you probably can't have so-so actor delivering brilliant line and have it work. You need brilliant line, brilliant actor, and there's this chemical equation. It's kind of still, you know, something that you could imagine George W. Bush still saying, you know? So I think it's still quite relevant. It's so absurd and in such bad taste that you never forget it. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. And that brings us to tonight's number one. The film was gone with the wind, but the line wasn't. In fact, almost 70 years later, it still remains the most famous one-liner ever in movie history. No, I don't think I will kiss you. Although you need kissing badly. That's what's wrong with you. You should be kissed and often, and by someone who knows how. Set during the American Civil War, Gone with the Wind focuses on the love story between Clark Gable's opportunistic Rhett Butler and Vivian Lee's scheming Scarlett O'Hara. A rocky relationship from the start, Rhett's last words to Scarlett are the bitter consequence of love gone wrong. Rhett! 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 You go! Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Clark Gable says it with absolute superiority, and anybody says that to you with that sort of tone, you've been spoken to. It's the most perfect line in the perfect spot, yes. You can't help but thinking, no, but you do care, you're gonna come back, you do give a damn. Red, you go. Where shall I go, what shall I do? And when he turned around, <laughs> woman, he said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. So many men must have been going, yes, fantastic, one for the blokes. What does it mean now? Um, it's, a, it's a great put-down line now. That's what it is. It's used as a put-down line. And I think that it's terribly interesting that the line is more memorable than the great movie. It was interesting with this because damn, back in the 1930s, was considered to be a cuss word. So he couldn't say, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. He had to say, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. He had to take the word down so that it wouldn't have impact. Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. A classic line from a classic movie. Well, that brings our countdown of great movie one-liners to an end. But don't worry, I'll be back. Until next time, may the force be with you. And in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Now show me the money. Oh. <laughs>
Uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've had to come back. As you can see, uh, we have a lot of people to, uh, to thank for this special, and all the movie companies have been terrific to us, showing these wonderful scenes and wonderful one-liners. Just got to fill in uh, 30 seconds, and we're all, almost there. Thank you for your company this evening. I'm wondering why we didn't include, of course, Fatty Finn, which was a movie I made back in the 80s. If you've uh, seen that movie, you'll realise why it wasn't in uh, the countdown tonight. Thank you for your company and thanks once again to all of these people who... Good night.